there was a lot of talk about different types of censorship and all kind of gymnastics that uh, journalists have to go through to avoid censorship. And one of the things that I've often wondered is uh, a true reporting of the situation in Fallujah. It seems like um, the American press certainly didn't uh, tell us what was going on, but I want to know if, in fact, there is a broader uh, Arab view uh, of that incident. You know, I think, uh, and I was, is this working? Yeah, I think yeah. that's Oh, okay. Um, that's a good question, and I think Fallujah, especially the second uh, American attack on Fallujah, was was woefully undercut. I mean, was it was not covered except by embedded reporters. Uh, I think that the Arab networks did a lot better. In fact, I know at least a lot of it had somebody that was not embedded, unembedded, that was working in the city at the time. Um, I you know I don't know the way around that at this point. It, it we sent one of our a very courageous journalist from the bureau into. Fallujah, and he left the day before the attack started. His reporting was riveting, uh, but it was one day of reporting, and you know, I don't think we understood exactly what happened there. And again, as I said in the talk, it, it is a, it's a deep fear of mine um, that we're not understanding the, the specific dynamics uh, of what's going on in Iraq. When I was there in 2003, we would just get in the car and go, and we could go anywhere, and it was, it was a liberating experience. I mean, I, it's, I've spent some years in the Arab world, and it's the first time that I felt I could report unencumbered. There were absolutely no restrictions on what I did. Um, that's it's it's almost 180 degrees at this point. I mean, you you just can't do that anymore. You can do it in southern Iraq a little bit, but it's very difficult in Baghdad, and it's almost impossible in the areas north and west, just for reasons of safety. And um, and I don't, you know, I think a legitimate criticism can be made that we're not informing our readers all that well about what's going on in the country at this point. Yes. Yeah. Do you find that there's a growing infrastructure for a local? media, local newspaper, television, radio, in Iraq now um, during this period of reconstruction? Yeah, I don't see, you know, there, there, there's definitely, yeah, I think the answer to that would be yes, and I, I don't want to speak with too much authority on that subject because I just haven't written about it all that much, but there's a pretty vibrant newspaper culture growing up. Now, it's still often, if you have enough money, you can open a newspaper, and so there's a certain perspective that each newspaper has, and I mean, that may be a very viable model. I don't think there's anything, any problem with that model necessarily, um, but it is a different model. Uh, same with TV, although TV is still mainly government supported, but I think we're seeing something interesting in that there's a lot more local TV than there would have been, you know, before the invasion. So you see, any, even a moderately sized city will have its own TV station with, with local programming, which is interesting. Same goes for radio as well. So I think that's, a, yeah, it's an, it's a, an interesting interesting development that we're seeing, I think, go on there. Um, you spoke a little bit about the minder, the person that followed you around uh -huh. um, to stop you from asking certain questions and so certain questions weren't um, answered in a certain way. Um, did, you develop, did you develop any strategies around that yeah. so you could ask, actually ask the questions you wanted to so they wouldn't detect that? And how did you, how did you lose the minder on that data you lost? That day, I think I just walked out of the hotel and didn't get him. I think it was either, if I remember right, it was two different experiences. In 1998, I, I don't remember exactly how it happened. In 2002, there were so many journalists at the time in Baghdad that they just couldn't keep track of us. And I was at the Boston Globe, which they didn't pay as much attention to. During the war, it's a different story, and actually kind of a funny one. The, the minder I had during the war was uh, a guy named Nasir Mahdawi, and he was the worst minder ever employed by the Iraqi government. Just a disaster. And um, even before the war started, I could tell he was like, you know, he would say things to me that were just outrageous. I, you know, he's like, everybody hates this guy. He said to me once when we were at, at the shrine, um, Kathamiya Shrine. And when he said those words to me, I knew I, it was almost like cultivating a source in Washington. I knew this, he was my ticket. I knew I could, I, I just showered him with scotch. I kept him busy at night, uh, you know. You know, promised him like all kinds of work, and we eventually actually did hire him after the Washington Post. And we became very close friends, in fact. And it became so. Nasir, I think so, Nasir, you know, there's a little bit. And I say this, he's one of my he's one of my dearest friends at this point. So I say this with, with a grin, but he's a little bit of an opportunist. And I think he looked at the landscape in March 2003 and thought he had a better chance for employment with the Washington Post than for the government, which was about to fall. So, um, so he did well. And he uh, and he would just look the other way. You know, he would uh, when I went off. You know, I, I made a decision early on in, during the war 
that I didn't want to cover the war as a war. I, I just I didn't think there was much I could bring to it. I mean, we had people embedded. Um, covering the war would have amounted to covering news conferences in Baghdad, which were, were not true. And I, I almost felt weird even writing some of this stuff. It just was so fantastic. Um, so I wanted to cover the P. I wanted to cover. I wanted to cover how a city responded to war. The war was a backdrop, basically, and I wanted to understand how a city was transformed and how a city was shaped by that conflict. And Nasir was essential to that because nobody would talk to me with any degree of honesty if Nasir was standing there with me. So um, Nasir would look the other way, and I would go off on my own. Um, uh, I would, you know, I would. Before the war, I had spent a lot of time trying to make contacts so that I could find people during the war when it mattered, and I was able to use those and. Uh, and toward the end of the war, Nasir actually helped me find people himself, friends of his who trusted him, and then in turn would trust me. So he, he was a character. And it's actually, it's kind of a tragic story because Nasir then did work with us at the Washington Post afterwards, and his house was bombed in uh, January 2004, and he and his family, we had forced to flee the country uh, to Jordan. And it's, uh, he gave up a lot to, uh, to work with me and um, to work with the Washington Post. And, it's just odd, you know, in these times of conflict, how, how things intersect, like how lives intersect, and that was one of the, the oddest intersections. Um, given the uh, elections in January in which the platform of the United Iraqi Alliance was, the second platform was uh, a timetable for withdrawal, plus these recent protests in the Ferdo Square, that you could say the democratic will of the Iraqi people is to see an eventual end of the occupation. At the same time, we have legislation that just passed the U.S. Senate in which $500 million is going to the construction of permanent military bases in Iraq. And I was wondering, um, I see a contradiction there, and I was wondering if you could <laughs> explain to me um, if you know anything about these military bases, do they appear permanent? and why hasn't the U.S. media been covering the construction of these military bases? Yeah. That's an interesting question. And I think there, you know, bases have not become a big issue in Iraq right now just because the country is facing such overwhelming uh, other problems right now. I mean, electricity is literally going to be less than it was last summer. And in 120 degree heat, that becomes all consuming. Um, the insurgency is so strong, maybe not as strong as it was six months ago, but it's still very, very dynamic. Um, unemployment, economy, I mean, all these issues are so great that I think bases are not the issue that we might expect, but I think they will become a huge issue in the years ahead. I'm, I'm, I think you can almost bet on it. And I think it's very clear that the Americans are creating permanent bases there. I, mean, I don't think there's any urgency on the part of the United States to depart Iraq, uh, especially with talk about Iran and Syria. Um, I think it's very convenient. To, it's very expensive, but it's also convenient in some ways to have such a huge military presence there. Um, you know, when we talk about sentiments, it's it's a those are it's a hard thing to, you know. Again, you, I, I never want to say this is how people think or this is what people are saying, but like you pointed out, there there was a, a significant protest the other day about an American withdrawal. You do hear people saying a time calling for a timetable for withdrawal. At the very least, say okay, security Iraqi security forces are at this point, and we can pull back this many troops. I mean, occupation is a humiliating pro idea. It is a deeply humiliating experience, and I think I don't, there's very few Iraqis I think that would say, "Yeah, great occupation." I mean, they just they don't they don't accept it. And even people who are the the strongest supporters of the U.S. project, for lack of a better phrase, um, will be careful in their public statements about about the occupation. Um, now, is that does that mean most people want an immediate withdrawal? They don't. A lot of people don't. I mean, people do fear the prospect of strife, of civil war, if there is a, a vacuum with an American departure. Do some people want it? Some people do. I mean, I think you, you hear different things. Um, you also hear a lot of people make the argument that as long as the Americans are there, people will fight them. And there's no question about that. As long as there's American presence in Iraq, people will fight them. That will go on um, as long as I can see in the future. So, so it's a really mixed bag. But I, and I don't, but I don't think you are seeing a clear um, perspective on the US military presence there emerge yet. I think it is still a little bit conflicted, and sometimes contradictory. What are the chances that those military bases are for the Iraqi military? I think they will turn over some of these facilities to Iraqi security forces as time goes on. I think that's probably true. I mean, what we see, we'll just drive you on. Being there, you see two bases that are huge and becoming very permanent that you suspect are, are permanent U.S. bases. Um, you know, beyond that, you know, they've already done this in some instances where they've turned them over to Iraqi security forces. But, 
you know, they've, so far those security forces have kind of a mixed record. I mean, you know, there's still this question of legitimacy, and I think when you when you look at what's going on in Iraq, legitimacy is always the is always the word to think about. It's it's a lot easier to deny legitimacy than to bestow it, and um, and until this government, and I think the elections went. I don't want to say far, but they went, they went in the direction of bringing legitimacy to a future government, but I don't think it's yet there. And I think these delays in creating a government have, have made that problematic. But until you have that, that sense of legitimacy or that perception of legitimacy, it's going to be hard for these security forces to become as, as strong as the Americans would like. Um, why don't we go here and then we'll go over that side. Go ahead. In the conversations that you had with people both before and after the war or more recently, what did you hear about Al-Qaeda and whether there was any connection with Saddam or any of the hierarchy there in Iraq? And then what do you hear now and how has that situation changed? We talked about the insurgency. How much of that is Al-Qaeda related now? But maybe what do the people think about Al-Qaeda? You know, I never heard it before the war. I mean, or even during the war. I think what you hear when people bring up bin Laden often is that the, Ameri the American presence in Iraq has brought these pe has brought people into the country to fight the Americans. I think that's, that they've turned, and you often hear this in Arabic, they've turned Iraq into a playing field, uh, into an arena for this fight. And it, you know, US officials don't help this by saying, yeah, we're, we're gonna fight them in Iraq. I mean, that does, and people listen to this kind of stuff, so uh, they hear it very clearly. That's where I hear it most often. Now, I think you are seeing, I mean, I think some of the, and you know, again, I don't want to speak with too much authority because this is, these are as a handful of interviews. Um, but the interviews I have done with with what you would call insurgents or, or, or whatever is, you know, there is very much a divide between what would traditionally be more kind of nationalist with, an, uh, with a religious veneer or an insurgency that's nationalist with a religious veneer that's very homegrown, very Iraqi. Some of us come out of the old Ba'ath Party. I mean, that's a very distinct group. There's also a very distinct group that's that's um, that's more what people would refer to as Wahhabi or Salafi or, you know, a much more militant strain of, of religion that is being used to define their fight. And I think you're seeing that stronger and stronger. I mean, what people will say is that the more homegrown uh, insurgency is bigger, but the more uh, Islamist or for, uh, other non-Iraqi Arab component of the insurgency is better funded, um, is, is more aggressively recruiting. It's hard to say what's, what's true on that. I don't think the American military knows either, but you definitely do. And you hear a lot of problems between those two elements. Uh, in Fallujah, it's huge problems. The, I did a story about a, a guerrilla who was in Fallujah, fled before the fight was over, and then went back and was killed two months later. And when I was talking to his family, all they could talk about was this, div this divide between non-Iraqi Arabs and Iraqi fighters. I mean, it's becoming, I think, a bigger issue in that, in that strip of land along the Euphrates, west of Baghdad. What I, I mean, I actually wrote about, I think I wrote about both of them, and it was just saying that the, 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 the sense of anxiety and unease in the city at the time, and that, to me that was the overwhelming feeling in Baghdad before the war, before the invasion actually started, I and mean, it was deep. And, and I remember, and I think as a journalist, you can, you, know, you can say it by people quoting people and having them say it, that's one way to do it, and you can also find manifestations of that anxiety and unease. And I remember doing a story about how people were like, loading up on guns and ammunition before the war. And it wasn't to fight the war, it was to, to deal with the aftermath. I mean, almost everyone expected looting. It was amazing, almost everyone expected looting after the war. And you never heard it brought up by US officials. Um, and in fact, it did happen that way. Um, so that was a challenge, you know, on, in, in, as a reporter, was to try to capture that. And, you know, I, a couple of th things on that. I, I remember sitting, you know, I think, we're so, I think as journalists, we're often reluctant to to break the rules or to push, you know, I think, you know, daily journalism right now is is not doing all that well because sometimes it can be very boring. And I think there's almost an, an urgency on our part to to make it more interesting, to make our writing different, to make our approach different. I mean, I think this is essential. And, you know, I think often we're we're, we're saddled with this idea that we're supposed to be fair and balanced, and what we get is bland. Uh, it's not. A, I think that's. I think you could say that about the coverage out of Israel and Palestine that it's often gutless and bland and boring. 
Um, and so that's a challenge. And I don't think I do it. I mean, I think it's, it's a problem. But I think it's a it's a goal that we have to think about as journalists is to is to find new ways to tell these stories and to make them real to people and, and make them real to our readers. Um, I remember sitting, I was sitting. You know, it was the first day of the of the invasion, and I was scared to death. I mean, it was the bombing had started, and uh, and we were talking to my editor, and, and he said, you know, you're there, and now, it's, now tell the story as you see it. And that was the best advice I'd ever heard as a journalist. Is like all of a sudden I felt like something was off my back, and I could just sit down on the computer, and I was going to write exactly what I heard, saw, and felt. And I think it was the best way to, you know, it, I didn't I didn't achieve the, the ambition, but it was it was a worthwhile kind of goal to, to try to try to do. I want to ask you why I'm about the behavior and ethics of journals in America. And the lawyers, the friends that are once told me that a lot of the journals tend to stay in a hotel and sometimes use a driver as a source. Um, have you seen any of that? I mean, I've heard that you know, kind of things go on in the hotel and the uh, laziness or uh, just kind of giving up on going up there. I think that's true. Yeah, I think I, I wouldn't Let say that's true. Like, the people here in the back. If you could just sort of summarize the question. The question was, you know, are, what's the status of reporting right now in Baghdad? Are, people, are, are foreign reporters staying in the hotel, not willing to venture out, relying on their drivers as sources, relying on, uh, I guess, Iraqi staff to do the reporting for them and then taking credit for it? I think that does happen. Um, now, does it happen? Is it, you know, is it, is it mendacious? Or, you know, to me, it's probably a lot of fear. You know, nobody wanting to get hurt. And they feel like an Iraqi might have a better chance than an American. I don't know if it's true or not. I try and I don't do it. I mean, but I don't have to write spot stories that much, so it doesn't. The kind of reporting that I do, I don't. I'm not put in those positions where I have to make a choice all that often. Um, you know, I guess if somebody was going to defend it, they would say it's a question of not getting the story. It's a question of you know either not having the story or having half the story, and that's better. You know, it's better to have half the story you know, because you're not going to get the full story. I don't know, but I'm not sure if that's right or not. And I, and I don't think I think it's, there's an ethical question, a moral question that you would send somebody in a situation that you're not willing to go yourself, um, I don't think you should, um, you know, and, but I do see, you know, but it, it does happen. There's no question about it. How did you start in journalism and how did you get into international reporting? And also, um, I'm assuming you're a pair of origins from Iraq. How did that affect what it was like for you in Iraq? You know, I started in, I actually knew what I wanted to do pretty young. I was 16 or 17. And, um, and I joined the AP pretty much the first week out of college because I knew the AP was the fastest way to get abroad. Back then it was. It's kind of different now, but back then it was. So uh, I stayed with the AP for for a few years, and then I went to Cairo as my first posting and then joined the Globe. Um, and I loved the AP. I had a great time, especially overseas. I thought it was a great place to work. Um, you know, it, um, you know, as an as an Arab, my, my family's Lebanese. And I, I wonder. I often think, how does you know, being, how does being an Arab Arab American affect my coverage, or or how does it um, affect how I write or what I write? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. You know, I think you always kind of have to search your feelings about that, and, you know, because I think it can it can affect writing in both good ways and bad ways. I remember, I guess, the most powerfully I felt it was the last day of the war when the government fell in Baghdad. And I remember standing. I was, you know. Three weeks at that point, which doesn't seem that long, but I was at the end of my rope at that, after three weeks, and I was ready for it to be over. Um, <laughs> a few days before, we'd heard stuff like it was going to last for six months, and I was like, there's no way I'm going to stay here. Um, but I remember standing on the street, and it, it, I, we, knew the, I mean, we knew the government had fallen when we saw the looting going on, um, because you just would never see that if, um, if the government was still in power. And... Um, and finally, so we were reporting all day. At first, my first inclination was to go to my hotel and lock myself in there because I was afraid the hotel was going to be looted. But um, then I kind of, then nothing was happening. I thought, well, I guess I should cover the fall of a government. And I left the hotel room and <laughs> went down into the street. And um, and it was incredible because it was one of those days where just reporting, everybody was just like the dam had broken. And it was just you, you, I, reporting like I had never imagined or experienced. It was so, and not that it was like. It, not that it was liberation, it was that, but it was also fear of an occupation. It was also wor it was also worry that the Iraqi currency, because it had Saddam's portrait on it, would no longer be used, and they'd lost their all their money. I mean, these, you know, questions that I would never issues that I never would have expected. But anyway, so then somebody yells, "The Americans are coming!" And so we go out to the main street, and there's this column of, of 
Marine tanks coming down Sa'adun Street going toward the statue. And I remember watching that, and I felt, and that, I, I did feel questions of identity really powerfully at that moment. I, you know, on the most basic level, I was, I was happy because I knew I wasn't going to die at that point. I mean, the war was over, so it was good. And then, then as an Arab American, I think I felt, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't sad to see Saddam fall, obviously. I mean, uh, you know, he cursed that country. Um, but here it was, you know, Baghdad's not Riyadh or Doha. I mean, Baghdad is, is Cairo and Damascus. And here, like, one of the great Arab capitals was now under, uh, under foreign occupation. And it gave you pause. And, um, and you worried about what, you know, what was next for it. And, um, and you worried that, you know, right, at that moment I felt like two cultures uh, that cannot occupy the same place were occupying the same place. And that worried me. And then as American, I think I just, I, all of a sudden I felt I was in awe of my country's power that, you know, for, for what turned out to be no pretext whatsoever, I mean, the weapons didn't exist. We had invaded a country, overthrown a government, and um, committed ourselves to remaking that country in, in an image we saw as similar to our own. Um, to me, that was awesome. And, uh, and I mean, that the true sense of the word, and like generating awe. Um, um, but I do remember that, you know, and I'll never forget. And then the interviews I started doing after that, and everything, I could look back on that day. It's interesting. I've gone back a couple of times to the, the story that I wrote that day, into the notebooks, and almost everything that played out in Iraq in the, the, the year that followed, you could ca you, it was captured in the interviews that day. Everything I heard on that day, I would, you saw play out in the months and years that followed, to me, or months that followed, I should say, we're still in years. Um, it was such a lesson to me that, you know, you've got to, you know, the best thing you can do as a reporter is, you know, it just listen. And the more you listen, the more you pick up, um, the better your reporting is going to be. And at the times that you make mistakes or when you think you know what's going on and you're always, I, I'm always wrong. I mean, I, I can see like the biggest mistakes I've made in my career is like thinking I know what's happening and being wrong. And also not believing what people tell me. I mean, Abu Ghraib is the best example of that. You know, we heard those stories in the, in the West and North. I mean, I heard them and I, you know, people told me about that. It's like, I would hear, I would hear these accounts and I thought, that's ridiculous. There's no way. That's impossible. I mean, they were so bizarre, and then, of course they were true. You know, and just and this has happened a couple other times where you, you hear things and you just don't believe it, and then you have to you know, and you're, you're you pay the price. I sound like I'm sucking up to my editors. I'm really not, but I'm, I, uh, I'm really blessed by my editors at the Post. They're, they have just they, they kind of share this vision for what we want to do with our coverage there. And um, you know, when I won, I mean, I felt like the Pulitzer was a reflection of all the bureau's work in Baghdad. But I also felt it was a huge reflection on the editors who knew what they, you know, who just who shared this vision and really, you know, and I've never ever been pulled back on a story or told to go somewhere else. If anything, I've been, you know, encouraged to just think about it in a different way or a different perspective, but it's really, it's, it's been one of the greatest experiences I've had as a journalist is working with my two editors at the Post. That wasn't always the case. I mean, I had a lot of frustrations at the AP and the Globe, the Boston Globe, and they, let's face it, they often had to do with Israel and Palestine. Um, uh, you know, I find editors, you know, in terms of competitive pressure, I don't know. Um, you know, we get shielded from that in Baghdad. If the time, New York Times has something, we, you know, we know we should have had. I mean, we, we, if we see the story, we know we should have had the story. They don't have to tell us that. Um, so we, and they really kind of seem to block, kind of run interference on most of these issues. Um, I think with, well, what I, yeah, what I did, I guess how I did it when I, in 2003, when it was my most sustained period there, it was a year straight there, I would probably usually over six weeks or eight weeks pick one topic that I wanted to cover, understand. And very, very general. Like once it was, it was the, the Shiite revival. And so pretty much, you know, I'd have to do spot stories every once in a while, but it was doing those longer, broader stories. And they would, you know, and I would tell them where I'm going. And I usually have four or five stories in mind before I started. And then over six weeks, do those four or five, I mean, just do them. And then, and they had already kind of signed on to the projects that they would they knew it was coming, and they were they were supportive of it. And they they would fight for the, the front page, which is you know what editors do. Um, the next one was Sunni insurgency. Understand that popular perceptions, you know, you know, along what's pop perceptions across that divide that's created by an occupation. That um, and then the fourth one I think was going back to it was after Saddam's capture, so it was again back to uh, going back to the Sunni triangle area. But each of these were very clear kind of ideas that we were going to pursue, and they weren't. 
you know, radical or, I mean, they weren't, they were, they were just very straightforward, but we concentrated on those as like, as they were going to drive our coverage for that, for that period of time. And I think it was pretty successful. I think it worked out pretty well. I mean, it, it was liberating as a reporter because you didn't feel torn. I mean, I think most often reporters would be torn in, or pulled in 20 directions and they can't focus and they can't, you know, they can't get a deeper sense of what's going on. And I never had that problem, especially during that year. Uh, if anything was opposite, I mean, they, they let me go for six, seven days and never check in. And then I'd come, you know, come back with the story, which was, which was great. Since I'm close to a mic, can I follow up on that? I, uh, yeah, when Howard Kurtz, the media reporter for The Post, wrote a sort of reflection on the, on the Post coverage, prior to the war, one of the things that came out from his reporting of his own newspaper was that the editors had really downplayed some of the, the criti not criticism, some of the skepticism about the weapons claims. And in fact, there were reporters inside the Post who wanted to question some of the Bush administration claims, and the editors had essentially put it on the back burner or shoved it in the back of the paper. So your positive experience with editors I, can you I'm, reflect yeah. on, I realize you weren't covering the weapons question, right. but, and but, I, but know, even in the post itself, it saw its own warts. Yeah, that's true. I think, and I mean, you know, I, it was a failure of American journalism before the war. I don't think there's any question about that. The Post, the Times, I mean, it was a, it was a failure that I don't think has been addressed. I'm not sure how you address it without questioning the very basis of how we do journalism in Washington, which is, you know, this, like I was saying in the talk, this over-reliance on authority and officialdom and uh, the official narrative. You know, I, I wasn't in the newsroom. I mean, I was hired and sent to Baghdad, and I, so and I think my experience was probably different than in Washington. I think there is a different climate in Washington, in national reporting, the international reporting. I think we have more freedom. I think we're, what I notice as a, as a foreign correspondent or, or reporter abroad, or how I describe it, is that I'm relied on to say what the story is, and that's not the case in Washington. I think there's a lot more second guessing, a lot more, and, um, you know, it's, it's safer, you know, let's face it, I mean, I think, and I, I don't want to criticize uh, my colleagues not knowing what their situation was, and, I, and I, maybe, maybe I would do the same exact thing, but, you know, it's easier to, it's more difficult to, to contradict the, the official line than it is to echo it, and I think that's, you know, it's a, one of the biggest problems we have in journalism. She wrote in Harper's. I thought that was just it was an outstanding piece of journalism. I, I recommend it to anybody because it's something that we didn't cover enough as daily journalists um, in our time there. Um, I, you know, my sense of that, and I, again, I, I don't want to speak with too much authority here because I haven't covered that much about. It. I haven't, I haven't dealt with the, the reconstruction project all that much. Um, but my sense of that, a little bit of the, the, you know, that slackened a little bit that effort. That was a real kind of remembrance. I mean, they very much had that vision coming in. The CPA did this idea of like starting from scratch. And I think they just got overwhelmed by events. I mean, you know, before Bremer left, two months before, he's, you know, there, was an, there was an uprising in two cities. I mean, the country was, you know, in flames, basically. Um, and my sense is that what they, ha what they have now, let's face it, the CPA, I mean, and I don't think, I'm not sure even people in the CPA would defend. The CPA was the um, coalition provisional authority, which ran Iraq from the fall of Saddam to, to about a year later, a little more than that. And I don't, I don't think anybody would call it a success. I mean, I think it was, it was pretty miserable what they, how they performed there. Um, you know, they were blinded by their, their ideology. And, um, uh, and I think what you see now in Iraq, at least among the American diplomats, is a much more professional group of people. Not, you know, I don't, I don't know if they're doing a good job or not, but it's a much more professional group of people with a much more understanding, with much more experience in the region. And, you know, it feels like you went from middle school to college. I mean, it's, it's kind of remarkable to see the difference. I don't know the answer to that. I wish, I'm, I'm just not sure. And it's, it's something that should probably be found out. Just for people who couldn't hear, the reference was to an article that Naomi Klein wrote in the September issue of Harper's, I believe, uh, called Baghdad Year Zero, which was about the attempt of the United States to privatized virtually all of the Iraq money. 
to come sell off stadium. You were next. I was just wondering if you could talk about the politics a little bit. We hear about the negotiations, Allah always trying to keep some power for himself, and I'm also wondering people in Baghdad, the man, on the, the man and woman on the street, you know, we hear they're getting frustrated that they don't have a cabinet. And, could you speak to that? Yeah, there's a, I think there's a lot of frustration. And I, the last conversation I had before I left was um, uh, I was over at the embassy, and I was just talking that they're, they're even concerned about this, how long it's taking. I mean, they felt the election, and I think they're right, the election created a dynamic that wasn't there before, necessarily. But the momentum that that dynamic uh, produced is, is definitely slowing down, if not, if it's not come to a halt. I mean, there's just, it's been three months, I think, no, January, March. It's been a while. Um, so the, you know, the government still isn't formed yet, and I think it is jockeying. You know, it's basically jockeying for power. And there is, there is, there are deeper issues there. I mean, there's all kinds of rumors of what's holding it up. I mean, you know, some Shiite leaders will claim that the Americans are pushing the Kurds and Alawi to make their demands as strong as possible, to so that they, you know, so they can keep secularism intact. That they can, you know, stuff like this. The American agenda is trying to be is, is the American agenda is being negotiated by way of the Kurds and Alawi. I don't know if that's true or not. The Americans definitely deny it. The US officials there deny it. Um, but I think there's also just this, you know, it's it's a new process. Um, it may, I think it may, you know, it's interesting. If you ask me, is will Iraq, will Iraq be in 10 years? I think it's very possible that Iraq could be an example to the rest of the region and could be a democratic state. I mean, I don't I don't see this. I think it's a, there's a, it's a much different country than when I left last year uh, when it, it felt very, it was hard to see it writing itself, and I think it may, I mean, who knows, I mean, it may not too, also, but um, I don't think it's bound to failure like it was before, and I think this process that we're seeing unfold, I think the election was breathtaking, and I, I didn't expect it to be as, I didn't, I guess I didn't expect the scenes that I, that I witnessed that day, and again, you know, and again, going back to that question earlier, I heard it, I mean, everybody I talked to was, you know, was excited about the election, I mean, even people who were, you know, in these broad categories we use, but Sunni Arabs I even talked to were wanted to take part uh, in Baghdad at least, and I think it was different in the Triangle. Um, I forgot. What it was. <laughs> um, and I think this this political process that followed the election, though, is it's very new, and, and there's an incredible time pressure on to get it to get it moving forward. And basically, the Constitution has to be done by the end of the summer, and the government hasn't even been formed yet. I mean, so. And then another election by the end of the year, so it's it's, a, it's a unbelievable schedule ahead. And um, and I think I guess just one kind of side note I'd make about the, the political process is I think when historians write about this, and I may be wrong, but I think when historians write about what's that there is this kind of, there is a reason for optimism optimism in seeing how the election took place, and some parts of the political process seem to be very uh, very interesting. But you're also seeing a sectarian and ethnic cast of politics in Iraq that wasn't there before. It's always been there. But the point where, where, where you see quotas, uh, basically, where you see power divided along ethnic and sectarian lines. This is something the Americans very much are responsible for. I mean, this is how they understood Iraq, and this is how they, this is the vision they brought toward the future of Iraq's political system, that it was going to be, I think, defined most basically along sectarian and ethnic lines. I think the bulk of Iraqis who were in the country, who were not abroad, wouldn't have seen it that way. And they, there's a lot of, uh, I think there's resentment about it, uh, I think there's a little bit of suspicion of, you know, the process, process is still dominated by exiles where, where ethnic and sectarian politics were very much the norm, but they, they weren't necessarily the norm inside the country. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I suspect that's going to be one of the, the greatest legacies of this, of this period, though. Can you say a little bit about your access to the voices of your occupants? That's definitely been the toughest part, and it's been, I think, the biggest... One of, you know, one of the bigger failings of my reporting that I couldn't do more of that. I think it's just, it's difficult as a man in Iraq to do that. I was able to find, it, it, once I did find people that I was able to you know establish trust with and they establish a relationship, I tried to very much keep keep it alive. Um, during the first days of the war, I was I wanted to do a story about a mother who had sent her son to fight, and uh, um, I did a story about her that day, and I ended up staying pretty really close contact with her and her family for the next year and a half. In fact, they're, they're a big part of the book. Um, her daughter kept a diary throughout the war, and her, to me, her evolution, this young girl, 13-year-old girl, was the evolution of her thinking through the war and its aftermath. It was one of the most uh, 
uh, remarkable things I'd seen in that country. I mean, there, in that moment, I actually saw liberation in a very powerful way. Um, and there, there was other examples where I tried to establish relationships um, um, with women, but it was difficult. And I think, you know, I think a very valid criticism could be made that the reporting relies overly on, on male voices. Here, and we'll come back down. I'm trying to keep track of how the order in which I see hands, so bear with me. So here we'll start with uh, Could you talk a little bit about how you and other American journalists actually get around Iraq now? Um, and you drive and beat up Iraqi cars to try to disguise yourself. And, and do you have do you carry do any journalists carry guns, or do you have armed guards? And as a, an Arab and as an Arabic speaker, what kind of advantages does that give you? over non-Arab and non-Arabic speaking Western journals? Yeah. Um, it's been a huge fight, and one that I lost, um, over how you deal with the danger in Iraq. And I think there's two, two visions of that. The first vision is that you try to melt into the landscape, as I'm overstating it. You just try to turn out to be conspicuous. Um, you don't travel with a lot of cars. You don't travel with a lot of people. This kind of thing. The other thing is to bu to bulk up, basically, drive in armored cars, guns, this type of thing. Um, you know, until I left, I drove just. I had my driver in Nasir, who became just. I mean, I wanted to travel with an Iraqi, he was somebody who understood the city and the country, and so Nasir and I worked together. Um, it was just us three, driver Nasir and me, um, and we drove in just a regular car, and it worked out pretty well. We never. I mean, we never. We haven't. Ha I have not had a problem. I mean, once got, Nasir got beat up a little bit once, but it was, I mean, it was okay, and that was the only instance that was bad until his house got bombed. Um, but I don't mean to make, I don't mean to make light of that. Um, and then, but then when I got back, there was, there, there, you know, the Post made a decision that, uh, one that I'm not real comfortable with, but that we do drive around now with um, a tail car, so a car follows us wherever we go, and in that car is an armed guard. Um, I personally don't think it's going to help anything. I mean, I think, you know, people, if they want to kidnap you and they know you have an armed guard, they should bring more guns to kidnap you with. I mean, I don't, I don't see what it's necessarily going to help. But, um, but you know, the Bureau has a policy, and, I, you know, I'm, and I'm part of that Bureau, so I feel like I have to, I have to go along with it. I think, there's a, I think decisions are being made in, in reporting right now that we're going to have to live with for a long time, um, and they worry me a little bit. I think, you know, we're less and less being treated as, as non-combatants. Um, I think we're just seen as another player in, in a very violent landscape. Uh, and, and, um, and if you're in a situation, it's not, you know, to kill a journal, I, I just think it's easier to, I think there's fewer red lines uh, over protecting journalists. And I think we see it from the American military. I think we see it from the insurgency. I mean, that's the only two people killed and the only journalists killed in the Palestine Hotel in Baghdad were, were killed by a tank round fired by the US military. Um, now, I mean, I don't know what the, I don't think that we've heard the, what the actual story behind that was, but I mean, that facts are facts. Um, and, you know, I think this arming ourselves and, and carrying guns, I just feel like this adds to that perception of us being combatants. And I, mean, I just, and I'm not sure what to do about it. I'm not sure if we don't report the stories so that we don't have to carry guns or report the stories and have guns and cars behind us or if there's a third way to do it. I just, I don't know the answer. You mentioned earlier that you were given some um, restrictions. You mentioned earlier, I believe, that you were given some restrictions or limitations in reporting on Israel and Palestine when you worked for the Boston Globe and AP. I was wondering if you could tell us a little more about those experiences, what those limitations or uh, I forget what term you used exactly. Were, and why you think they were requested to be in place? Yeah, I think it's mainly language, the use of language. I, and I personally don't think the word terrorism or terrorist adds much to copy. I mean, I think you're better off describing the, the, what it is. If, I mean, it, you know, it's a terrorist attack. Why is it a terrorist attack? Explain why it's a terrorist attack. And I think that, that description, the power of, of words, is what we do. And I think it's, so it's fights like that, trying to add language that I don't think should be in the copy. Um, you know, the AP used to be ridiculous about not using the word Palestine. I mean, it was just insane. In fact, I wrote a lead once about Palestine. It was about Palestinian police, and I referred to Palestine's finest. I mean, 
create an uproar. You know, like, we can't save Palestine. So, I mean, just silly things like that, which I don't really, you know, I, I don't understand it completely. I think, in fact, my, my sense is that it's just, you know, editors don't want to deal with controversy. They don't want to deal with trouble. They don't want to deal with the phone calls and the, and the letters and the emails. And so they go for what's safe. And uh, I don't know, you know, obviously it's not good, but I mean, I remember somebody, I, I suggested a story back then before I got hurt that I wanted to, I was going to just do a drive from, I forget where it was from, was it from Hebron to, to Ramallah? I forget where it was, but I was just going to do a drive through the checkpoints, and this idea was it was like you know, 20 miles, and it was a day-long journey, and I was just going to write about what it was like. And I told one of my editors, he was not the editor, but one of my editors, and he said, you know, I'll get a thousand phone calls if you write that story. I was like, well, let's, you know, we should do that then. I mean, that's, you know, that's the whole point is like, so. But, and I don't want to say that I'm, uh, I mean, I don't want to paint myself as I'm somehow really brave in doing that. I mean, I'm sure I make compromises along the way as well. But, um, um, but you know, that's my sense of it, actually, because I have tried to understand it, because I don't think the coverage is that is very good out of that region. And I think it's just, it's a fear of controversy that, that creates a lot. And, and it really, almost in a banal way, I mean, I don't find it very ideological. I just find it kind of, you know, it's kind of mundane, the way that, that things are pulled back. Um, and, you know, that's like I was saying earlier, I think the biggest danger we face, not that I'm using this phrase a lot, one of the big dangers we face as journalists is that we just have to fight this tendency to, to make, to turn, the, turn an idea which I think is worthwhile of being fair into, you know, to writing bland, into writing boring, into writing stuff that doesn't, you know, say much. I think that's, I mean, we, we can, you know, we can be fair and we can still write with passion and courage and emotion and um, our job is to explain to the reader what is going through somebody's mind, or what is going through their head. And, you know, I got a lot of criticism for writing about an insurgent who was, who had left Fallujah and came back. And like, would you be writing about, you know, Nazi stormtroopers in World War II? And, you know, I actually would. I think, you know, I think it's our job. I mean, I'm a journalist before I'm an American. And I think it's, you know, it's my job to explain to people what, um, what we're encountering, you know, in this country. So maybe I'm wrong on that. I just might, it's kind of my sense of things. Yeah, you know, I, this, I don't know the answer to the first one because you heard a lot about it, and I just I, and I wasn't there, and so I don't. I hate to say anything on it. I. Um, you definitely heard people talk about it a lot, but I don't know. I mean, but that, it could have been something like phosphorus grenade. I don't know what it was. Um, you know, and the, the tough questions. I don't deal like kind of the way we've worked it out in the bureaus, where I, I like my colleagues deal more with the American embassy and the American military. Like we have a reporter that's full time embedded. That's all he does is embed with U.S. troops. And I haven't embedded yet. Um, and so I deal. So the, I guess the tough questions. I really don't deal with. Um, um, with U.S. officials and the U.S. military all that much in my reporting, um, you know, it's, it's funny when you talk about tough questions. It's, you know, there's two stories I think back on to, to about asking questions, and this may be better for tomorrow morning when we maybe talk about the craft a little bit more. But, you know, as a reporter, you always like how you know how do you establish trust with the people you interview, and how do you, um, you know, so that they'll talk to you, and so that they'll explain to you what, something beyond the kind of the trite and the hackneyed. And um, I remember during the war, I was. The questions were irritating people so much because I was trying to get as much detail as possible to the point where I wanted to know what they were eating when the bombs fell or when the bomb fell. And it would drive people crazy. And I felt, you know, it was almost, I felt kind of vulgar. You know, that I was having to ask these questions, but I knew that if I was going to capture this moment to a reader, they had to see it in the, the, in the strongest light possible. Um, or in the most vivid way possible. Um, and I think back to another story. So, I, you know, that's something about being very aggressive in your questioning. But then I think back to another story where. The father, I was writing about a father who had killed his son, because his son was an American informer. And, um, um, you know, I knew that his father had killed his son before I interviewed the father. And I was sitting with him in his, in his, um, in his house, and I formulated the question in my mind, and then, you know, came to the task of that, and I just I couldn't ask him that. You know, it's just, I mean, it's, it's a profession where we kind of celebrate, you know, confrontation, you know, it's all about confirmation. I just, you know, it wasn't worth it to me. Not and in the end, I didn't have to. And probably the only way he would have spoken, I mean, and I look back on that, and if I had asked the question, he probably wouldn't have said all that much. He probably would have just stopped and the interview would have been over. But I didn't ask the question, and he ended up talking. And he said something to me that I think, I think, and the career is still kind of short. It's, it 
brings the most memorable, memorable words I've ever heard. And he said, not even the prophet Abraham had to kill his son. Uh, and he said that there was no other choice. And those words, I still like almost get you know, choked up when I think back to those words because um, it was a choice like I had never heard. But again, it goes back to the idea of questioning. Like, how do you question? You know, I guess you just kind of follow your gut um, when to ask and when not to ask.
but you still don't believe all these stories. And I think there's a real danger of manipulation. I mean, the military does frown on reporters whose stories they don't like, and they deprive them of them as it happens. It's happening right now as we speak. And, um, and this is where, this is the beginning of excesses when you, you only have one kind of report that you can do. And then I think the other dangers are reporters being killed when they're not embedded because they just don't, there's a certain, um, I think the military, well, there's a lot of forces out there that can be dismissive of journalists and, um, and avoiding their protections. Well, I'm interested in, in talking to you um, more tomorrow about some of your current projects. But um, looking to the future, um, do you plan on covering the trial and sentencing uh, and, and do you have any questions? Probably won't do that story. Actually, there's probably going to be somebody else in this story. We're probably going to start spending a little more time on the rest of the year with Paul. But I, I do want to stay in Iraq. Stay with the story as long as we're there. We'll go back and we'll kind of make one pass around the people whose hands are up before we quit. We'll go in the back and then I'll come around. Can you give us your thoughts on how you think, why you think the media got no weapons of mass destruction story? So wrong, and um, and can you talk more about compromises that you feel that you've made some more? First one, I don't. I just I, I can give my thoughts. I just you know I wasn't involved in that story and I wasn't there. So see um, I just don't know the answer. Um, you know, I, I mean, at the very basic level, I mean, there's there is no more reliance on. Them. Like I said, officially. Mm -hmm. It's very easy for the stories to be guided and directed. Um, uh, I mean, but yeah, beyond that, just not going to offer anything insightful. I mean, the, the, the player probably could, could be far more insightful than me. The compromises that I made, I felt, you know, I felt once I got to the post that I haven't had to compromise, especially in Iraq on reporting. And I think that's why I've enjoyed the experience so much, is that I had editors that were completely on board with um, what we were doing. And I've been really lucky about that. I think in the past,
complex necessarily. Um, and I had stayed in Doris the first day. So what had happened is there was the bombing and the time and the time. And I expected the, the Israelis would do something the next day. So we went to Ramallah to, you know, to be in place. And they did come in that night. I thought it was just going to be something quite was going to be an airstrike or something. And so I didn't bring anything with me. And then they reinvaded the, the West Bank. And it was a huge military operation. So I was in, first day I stayed in my hotel, just scared. And then the second day, I got a little bit more. Third day, I got more. And the fourth day, it was, it was great reporting. In fact, I went to this hospital on the fourth day. And it was the most, to me, it was the most amazing story I think I'd ever reported uh, up to that point. And it was because the Israeli army was trying to come into this hospital, and doctors and nurses were, were not letting them in. And there was this confrontation at the gate of that hospital that I thought encapsulated the entire occupation. And I was right there taking notes of these visits. They were yelling at each other. Argument. It was a, it was a philosophical debate on the essence of what was happening. It was just, I think it was remarkable to me, and um, and I was so excited that I had it all. So I was going back to my hotel. Um, I had the black jacket on to be marked on my back. Um, I was in the Mukata, which is where Arafat's compound was, and that's uh, it's probably 100 yards away. It was under uh, full Israeli military control. Full, I mean, complete. There were snipers on every, there were on the roofs. There was tanks on each side of the street. Um, so I was walking with a friend, I had, I had my flag check, and I was carrying my notebook and pen. And um, it was one shot. Um, I didn't see it, but I'm, I'm sure it was a really soldier in the top of my mind. Um, one shot that hit me in the back. Um, it entered the shoulder, and then it actually sheared the vertebrae off, but it didn't hit my spinal cord, and then it came off the shoulder. Uh, so I fell to the ground. And then the person was with me, um, picked me up, and we, we you know, it's weird. You always wonder how you can react to the situations. And, uh, I was sitting there laying on the ground, and I thought, I should say, I thought I was going to die. I was like, oh, I should say something. <laughs> so I was also my, like, you know, tell my daughter I love her, and I was like, oh, that's, that's a cliche. I mean, <laughs>
right? So, um, I always think with language is that you got four different places where I've used a translator Afghanistan or um, Iran, Turkey. And I feel like you can still have a good reporting. I guess, you know, with language, I think you native speakers here, or Charles, maybe attest to this, is just you hear the background noise that you wouldn't hear otherwise. And I think the, the background noise is so important to adding context and texture. Or well, texture, but it adds texture to the story to give a sense that you're there. Um, that's those little things. I mean, I, to me, you know, the most important, the most important thing about writing and reporting is detail. It's all about detail, and you can sometimes you carry away with detail, but you know, it's just you know, without that detail, you'll never be able to write you know, a story that that's some, I, that I think is somehow meaningful. Language, of course, is crucial. Um, you mentioned the, the disturbing new trend of considering uh, journalists combatants as opposed to observers. Um, I was wondering if you think there's any relationship between that new trend and the new mechanism of embedding journalists in the military units in exchange for access to the consequent uh, profession of compromise. Well, this is my fear. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I, I think this is the real danger of what we're seeing is that, you know, especially in a place like Iraq where it's difficult to do any reporting that's not embedded. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. And, um, you know. Certainly, um, with demand for court. Yeah. 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 I guess courage is the right word. I, it's always places you just can't go. I mean, as courageous as you might be, it's just be, you know, and you endanger people with you. You endanger your driver. You know. Um, but I think I, my sense is that you can, you can report anywhere in Baghdad. Thank you. 
democracy in Iraq. What evidence do we have to support that? That's a good question. I, you know, I, I hope I haven't gotten the impression that I think we're on the right track. I'm not sure what track we're on, to be, to be honest. I, I think it's still a real question of whether, I, I just think it's possible that things may work out. I think it's also possible things may not. I can see it going either way very easily. It doesn't feel, that, but this is a, a gut feeling. This isn't something that, that's all that, that grounded in fact, but it doesn't feel as bad as it did in October, when it's just felt It's rather scary. I mean, I, November, I got back in early November, and November was still bad. I mean, the scariest that I ever thought the Iraq had been, and that time, not as a Baghdad, I'm talking about, I should be specific, but it was Baghdad. Um, you know, but this is, you know, I just, we just had a you know, general just remark the other day to, uh, to the post that, Insurgency has lasted eight, nine, ten years. And he said we're in the second year. This is the military saying this. I don't think the military expects this to be over anytime soon. I don't think it will be over. I think as long as the military is there, we're going to fight the military. Um, you know, is it getting better or worse? It's not as bad as it was in October. It's not as good as it was in February. You know, and it, does, it does seem to go in kind of cycles a little bit. It goes back and forth. You know, where is this all headed? I just think. From your experience, what's going on through young people's minds? I think you do. It's interesting. I, I, this the family that I was mentioning, that I, that I spent a lot of time with, I was over at their house the other day, and there was just, just an amazing debate over basically over the occupation, over the American military, over the United States, everything. And I do think you see a generational divide in, a, in optimism. You know, I think you know, older people do are more are more gloomy. It's it's to me the one the one quality that defines Iraq to me greater than any other quality is resilience. And I've never seen a more resilient place in my life. I saw during the war after some of the worst bombing, you know, people be in the streets again the next morning. It was just remarkable. And I think you know when we think about what people there have had to put up with, um, you know, like I said, 120 degree heat with no electricity, it's just it's mind boggling. I had people, more people aren't in the streets. It's incredible. Well, you know, gas lines that side of, it's better now, but at one time we're stretching six miles in the country with the second largest oil reserves. I mean, it's really, what people get by as they do is, is pretty remarkable to me, I think. Um, so, very few people will tell you they're not optimistic about the future 10 years from now. You often hear that. I think it's almost it's kind of springs from that resilience that's such a defining quality in that country. Um, when you ask more specific questions, though, you do, I think you do see kind of a generational divide where younger people are a little more hopeful and older people are a little more. It's not going to get better. And that, um, you know, there is a sense that you know, people say this often that you, know, you need a strong leadership in Iraq. And cliche, it's a cliche, um, but you hear that voice by older people much more often than younger people. And I think there is. A, you know, it's interesting. This young girl, this 13 year old, who wrote this diary during the war, and then so I, I, just, I think her transformation has been so remarkable. She, she said to me, "We've experienced a revolution. You know, we, don't want, we don't know what that revolution is, but it's, it's a revolution." You know, I think her whole process of trying to understand what that revolution is is you know, part of her maturity and her, her becoming mature. Oh, thank you. My question concerns um, spin, propaganda, and interference by the U.S. government and the media, which, far from being a conspiracy theory, is amply documented in American history, such as the Creole Commission. I believe two months ago, or three months ago, well, the last couple months, during a White House press conference, it was revealed that the White House was giving pre-made tapes to uh, media outlets, which went along with an official government line concerning certain news. My question to you is, have you experienced it? And um, a set of question to that is, do you think the USA Patriot Act 1 and 2 have anything to do with this type of manipulation, or if it could have an impact? And I'll speak, and I'll say, I've got to speak from experience on these kind of things. If I get wrong, I have not felt manipulation by the government in what I do in Iraq. Other than you know news conferences where I mean, you look back at these transcripts, they can sometimes be ridiculous. I mean, some of the free things that were going on at the height of awful things happening in Iraq. So I mean, other than just, but that, I, mean, I don't have any problem with that. It's a, you know, the government can put out their line, and that's their job. They should you know get their version of events out there. The problem becomes when we take it as the only version of events. And I think the post, I, mean, I think we can look back at post coverage of Iraq in 2003, 2004, we actually got it right. I think we did see 
was happening and, and the direction things were going. Um, you know, my colleague Rashid Shah Sekhar, I think, did an excellent job on the U.S. side of things. Um, so, and I think the, the reason we did that is because, you know, unlike you might make the argument, Washington, it's harder to do that. In Iraq, the American government was just one player among many, and we're, we're no, you know, they didn't like us. That was fine with us. We could put something else. So I thought I felt. I mean, looking back on that, I felt it worked pretty well. It's not as easy now, of course. Just to clarify, one of the reasons I asked that is you said that when some of your colleagues put out stories, they were color coded or something like something was neutral. The military coded. Oh, military coded. Yeah. So you don't experience that. Yours, the editing process does not involve any sort of spin or um, an interested position. Is what I'm trying to get out. I, I'm not ever. You know, the editing, and I, and I say this honestly, the editing that I've had the most has made my stories better. You know, I've never felt that, I've never felt the thing where I was, I mean, you know, where I was compromising something in my copy of the post. It really happened. And I'm not just saying that either. Um, you know, I think there are outside, you know, like I said, the military does collect all these stories and they deprive people of doing it. And that's, that's something we should worry about. That's from that, from that, there's. Uh, I can respond to that because I saw a press conference early in the Iraq War where Tommy Franks, the American general, stood at a podium in front of a quarter million dollar soundstage constructed for briefings, and he said, this is a platform for truth. <laughs> yeah, I was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's all the time we have uh, tonight, but I, I want to just take a moment before we thank Anthony to remind us that at 9.30 tomorrow morning, down in the dining room of this building, uh, one floor below, we're going to have an informal conversation. And as we said, we'd like to invite everybody, but especially those students and those students with uh, interest in journalism and career at come. The pitch is we've got a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who can help you with career counseling. Uh, the second is there's food. And the third is the food is free. So, so we would encourage everybody to, to join us. And, and I hope you won't take offense here. Uh, a second grade journalism professor from a third grade college giving you career advice of your own. But <clears throat> just to close, perhaps, I'd, I'd like to reflect. We all know that to make it really big in journalism these days, you've got to go on the TV talk show. If the, real, the reporters who really launch careers that matter are the ones who will go on, you know, this week and all of those Sunday morning talk shows. And you know what it takes to go on those talk shows. And uh, I personally see a reporter who's sees nuance in the world, uh, understands ambiguity, uh, is willing to admit mistakes, doesn't think he's right all the time. You got a lot of work to do, buddy, if you're going to make it on TV talk shows. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard, you idiot. You know, just a little you know, welcome advice that if you're going to remain a thoughtful reporter, self-critical, critical of the industry, and even critical of the US government, you're going to have some real problems, buddy. So just a little friendly advice. Please help me thank. Anthony Shadid for a wonderful talk. Thank you, sir.